I'm Tavi Nasir, and this is Leadership Biz Cafe, a podcast that provides insights and tools to help leaders take on the challenges and opportunities found in leading today's workplaces. Leadership Biz Cafe is brought to you by Tavi Nasir Leadership, our leadership firm that offers keynotes and corporate trainings in both in-person and virtual settings that will help you to improve the way you lead and guide your organization's growth and future successes. Now, if you've been enjoying my podcast and the insights and tools I've been sharing on how you can improve your leadership craft, and you're interested in having me expand on them with your team and organization, I'd like to invite you to check out my speaking page on our website at tavernasir.com to learn about some of the topics I can discuss at your upcoming event. And now I'd like to introduce my guest for this episode, Tamara Sanderson. Tamara is the co-founder of RemoteWorks, an organizational design and consulting firm that's on a mission to liberate teams from traditional work approaches and teach them how to do their best work anytime and from anywhere. In addition to being a former Googler, Tamara has worked at Automatic and IDEO. I've invited Tamara on the show to speak about her book she co-authored with Allie Green called Remote Works, Managing for Freedom, Flexibility, and Focus. Hi, Tamara. Welcome to the Leadership Biz Cafe. Hi, thanks for having me. So Tamara, before we talk about your book, Remote Works, I'd like to first address the ongoing tug of war between employees and their organizations over the option to work remotely and various return to office or RTO mandates. While initially we saw this drive to get employees back into the office happening in Wall Street and then amongst big tech companies, every day it seems there's another story about another high profile organization retracting their initial position that their employees could work from anywhere to now having to be in the office for at least two or three days of the week. And we're starting to see reasonable arguments for why this is necessary, such as new hires not getting enough exposure to help them advance in the company, to legitimate concerns about rising levels of loneliness within the workforce population. Now, I know your co-author, Ali Green, and you address this throughout your book, but I think it'll help people be more open to understanding your approach if we first deal with this issue head on. So, How do we strike that balance of giving people the space to work when and where they want, while also making sure we're not penalizing new hires or young employees from opportunities to grow and develop, not to mention ensuring this only ends up with people working in isolation without that sense of connection and belonging? Yeah, so this is a great question. So there's a couple different aspects I want to dive into. First, I would say if you are still having people, so if you say, hey, there's a mandate, you have to come in you know, Tuesday through Thursday or two to three days a week, I would say you still need to organize your company as if it's a remote first company, because if not, then you're putting people at a disadvantage and you're not really, I don't know, designing your company to be functional or fully functional on the days that people are able to work from home. And so even though you're seeing these different mandates, I would still say that they are a remote company, even if it's not all of the time. So that would be one one thing I would just kind of put out there. Um, second, I would also just say, you know, always read news with a grain of salt. So what is going to be newsworthy? A company with a, a very, I don't know, boisterous CEO that's making a really strong stance about how remote doesn't work or, you know, all the different small, medium-sized businesses that have been working fine remotely for the last, you know, three or four years. So I think that's also a thing. What is new? What is controversial? um, What are big, big names? Those are going to be the ones that make the media. But I also think it's really important to remember who is saying these things. So first of all, if you're at a company that has a lot of infrastructure that was already invested in before the pandemic, uh, then they're going to want people to keep using that infrastructure if they've not been able to sell off their capital or real estate, right? So um, I used to work at Google for six, seven years. They have a lot of beautiful buildings. They put a ton of money into that. It's very hard to sell. Like who is going to buy the Google campus in Mountain View at this moment? And so there is something there about this push to use, you know, these assets that they've invested in. So I think that's one thing to remember. And also remember how like CEOs came up the ranks. So if you have felt like you've been very successful at your career, um, that you know how work works and you've always been in an office, it's going to be very hard to change your mind based on the experience you've had going up the ladder, even if that might not work for a lot of the other employees. And you might not have that experience of what is it like being a new employee? What is it like being an employee that might, 
you know, live in a different city or a different country? What about an employee that might be balancing family responsibilities with work? Like you may not have those experiences and therefore your idea of just bringing people into the office is something that might be very specific to your experience, but might not be best for the entire organization. Um, so those are some things that I like to point out. Uh, Allie and I usually talk about sunk costs and uh, self-fulfilling uh, rationality and also just um, how people kind of want to make a quick agreement. And usually the quick agreement is like, okay, we have some people that want to work remotely, some people that want to work in the office. Let's just make it hybrid and have them come in two to three days a week. And sometimes that might be the best thing for the company, but we always ask the question of, if you started your company today, how would you organize it? And from there, if it is, you know, we want people to come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that would be the very best thing for a company, go for it. But if that's not really how you would design it, then I would question people to kind of look further. And then last, um, sorry, I'm kind of rambling with this, but I have a lot of thoughts. So I'm glad you're bringing this up at the beginning. Um, I would also say for new hires, I do think onboarding can be really important in person as well. And so I don't think like if you are having a new class of people. So, for example, I joined a consulting firm, Oliver Wyman, out of undergrad. Uh, the first two weeks we had one week we were in Chicago, one week in New York. We did all this training and bonding and social events and learned about the company culture before going back to our home offices and then becoming consultants at different client sites around the world. Those two weeks were really, really important for me. And you can do those very easily remotely as well. Um, there's no reason you can't have a remote company and still bring people together once, twice, three times a year to make sure that they have that contact with other colleagues, that they understand the company culture, and then let them go from there and continue to do their work from different locations. I'm glad you share that, Tamara. And I think that helps address any listener out there who, as we now talk about the ideas in your book, have less reason to be thinking, yeah, but, and instead be open to thinking, yeah, and this is how I see myself making that shift in how I lead going forward. And with that, there is a lot of ground I want to cover with you from your book. And I think you've given us a great place to begin our discussion because I want to start with your concept of the remote works manager archetypes, which refers to how you approach your role as a leader. And I think this is a big part of what's missing in all these debates about the future of work because so many of the decisions being made have less to do with employee performance and more to do with manager preference. So could you walk us through the four archetypes you describe in your book and why it's important for leaders to understand their primary archetype, because we have more than one, in the context of being effective at leading remote employees? Yeah. So with these manager archetypes... We have a little quiz in our book so that you can find out which one you you naturally gravitate towards. But as all good ex-consultants, I put things in a two by two. So ours is based on, I guess, the, the Y axis is if you're more team focused. So this means that in your day to day, are you kind of working with your team? Are you really engaged in the things that they're creating, the things that they're doing? Or are you more organization focused where you report upward, outward, externally? And so that's kind of the first axis. And then the other axis on the X axis is, are you hands-on or are you hands-off? So that does this mean, you know, if you're hands-on, you're somebody that's involved in a lot of the day-to-day, -day, um, that you really have a lot of prescription on how things go. And if you're more hands-off, you let people kind of do their own thing. So with that, I'm going to describe these four archetypes and give you kind of a picture based on music. I always like to use metaphors that I don't know, don't have as much business jargon. So you can kind of imagine it and then think of yourself uh, and which which archetype you might fall into. So first we have a band leader. And so when I think of a band leader, there's somebody that's very team focused, but they're very hands off. And so I don't know if you've ever been to a live jazz concert, but it is very fun. And what I noticed is often like the band leader, they're playing a musician, they're playing an instrument, they're up there on the stage, they're doing their thing, but they also really trust everybody else to kind of jam and play their own thing. Uh, when I think of the promoter, uh, we use the, the example of the fifth beetle. And so this is somebody that's hands off and organization focused. So uh, the fifth beetle, he, he basically was like, great. I've got these four awesome musicians. This is a really good thing. All I need to do is tell the world how good they are and stay out of their way. 
And so if you're a kind of more of a promoter leader, then really you are kind of, you know, telling the rest of the organization all this awesome work that your team is doing. You're trying to make sure that they can actually do their work well, that they're not getting in all these inbound requests and fire drills and all these things. You're kind of trying to protect your team to do their work well and elevate it within the organization. Uh, we also have the agent. This is the one that I think gets a lot of flack. And I actually do think there are times where the agent archetype can work really well, but this might be more of a micromanager. And so for this, we use um, Girls' Generation, which is a K-pop band. And I, I like did a lot of research. So I really like K-pop. I used to live in Singapore for four years. There's this giant advertisement of Girls' Generation when I would kind of get off of the MRT stop. And basically, you have these women in Korea that they they go through all these auditions. Then once they're chosen, I think it's multiple years before they're even allowed to perform on stage. And so it's very, very curated. It's very, very controlled. And so the agent is somebody that's very organization focused. They care a ton about how their team looks, but they're incredibly hands on and like what their team is allowed to do and not allowed to do. And so they're just really, really, really managing all of those details. And when I say that, you know, in general, it's much harder to be kind of this micromanager when you're a remote in manager because your team is not in front of you. There is going to be distance regardless. Um, but it can be good too if you have a brand new team that's never worked remotely, if there are people straight out of undergrad you may want to be more in that agent because they're going to need a lot more handholding. And then as they have more autonomy and they know their skills and they've mastered more, you may want to lead into the other archetypes. And last but not least, we have the composer. Um, my co-writer, Allie, often says that she's a composer. But this means that you're hands-on and team focus. So a composer, for example... They're not going to be but like the band leader of like, let's just go out on stage and let's make some cool music in a jazz bar for the next three hours. A composer has written the music. They know what's going to be played. Um, they're going to be focused on their team. But, you know, like the violinist has to play at a certain point. You know, the, 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 the person on the flute needs to come in at a different point. Like they can't just make up what they're going to do or else the whole symphony is going to be messed up. And so when you're a composer, you may be like a really great product manager or a project manager. There's a lot of things that have to happen, um, you know, in different orders for everything to come together. But once you have that plan, you let people have the autonomy because you know that they're going to be able to do their work really well based on the place that they're contributing. So those are kind of the different archetypes. So we really recommend that people swing between those depending on your team and the circumstance and what kind of function you're working in. So Tamara, there was a study that came out recently about the tech sector that revealed that while amongst the large tech companies, there's this pushback against remote work. For smaller tech companies, those with a workforce of 500 to 5,000 employees, they're doubling down on making their workplaces fully remote as a way to compete with the larger tech firms like Alphabet, Facebook, and Amazon. And what's interesting is for one of them, Airbnb, they've not only seen a drop in attrition in going fully remote, but they've also had an uptick in hires from underrepresented minorities, not to mention achieving their first year of profitability. And internal feedback has shown that their employees are not only more productive, they're happier with their jobs. Now, this is in contrast with other reports from the Harvard Business Review and the Atlantic, which found remote work is leading to rising levels of employee loneliness. Now, my background is in pathology. And when I see these contrasting reports, what I see is that we're focusing on the symptoms and not the underlying causes. And this is one of the issues Allie and you address head on in your book, where you point out that when it comes to managing remote employees, we need to be sure we're addressing their need for security, autonomy, mastery, and connection. So could you explain how do leaders address these needs within a remote work setting? Yeah. So I, I love that you're bringing up um, your background in pathology. One of the people we interviewed for our book is a friend that is uh, an ER doctor. And he used a lot of kind of uh, medical terms and medical concepts to kind of apply to remote work. So I think, yeah, you're right about looking at the symptoms uh, versus what are kind of the root problems. I love that you're looking at that. And I have a lot of thoughts on the loneliness comment. We, we can go on to that later. But uh, when Allie and I were talking about this, and we both come from different, Allie was an organizational psychology major at McGill, 
And um, I'm a psychoanalysis fellow. And so we were coming at it from much more of a psychological perspective. And so we looked at different frameworks. Um, I think one was like a self-directed theory. We looked at Maslow, et cetera. And also based on our own experience, and we kind of drilled down that there's really four needs that employee needs met at a company. And you mentioned these, but I'll go into a little detail of what exactly are these. So the first thing is security. And you might wonder what is security? Um, that is usually the, the bottom of a Maslow's hierarchy. But this just means that what a company promises needs to be delivered. And so if I'm an employee, I need to know that, yes, my paycheck will be given, If uh, that I can speak up and not be uh, reprimanded, that there's psychological safety, um, that we have a fair review process, that the HR rules are going to be followed, that I'm not going to be discriminated against. All those kind of basic fundamentals that you, like what an organization has promised you um, when you signed your employee contract, when you look at the mission statement, when you have gone through the training with HR, that that will actually hold true. And that's the first thing that needs to happen because a job is a job at the end of the day. And a lot of us work because we need to be paid, to pay for the things in our lives, whether, whether it's our home, food, clothing, um, supporting children, et cetera. And so that's kind of the first things first. Um, next is people need a place where they can feel like they have autonomy. And this is a huge part of remote work. If you, I think at the very beginning of our book, we mentioned something like, if you do not care about autonomy and giving people autonomy, then just like give this book to somebody else because you can't really do remote work without trusting people to get their work done on their own and treating them like an adult. And so when I think of autonomy, I usually like to give an example of high school versus college for people that went to university. Um, so in high school, you don't have that much autonomy. So I remember I went to like eight different classes per day. I had very specific homework. A teacher watched me. I had to have a hall pass even just to go to the bathroom. I had five minutes to get between classes. Then I had basketball practice and had to do homework. And I did this for, I don't know, 200 days a year, right? So there was not much freedom. It was very, very prescribed. But I got a lot more autonomy when I went off to university. And what I mean by this is I would have a professor at the beginning of the school year. They would give me a syllabus. You know, here's the books that we're going to read. This is when we're going to have our exams. This is what I expect you to learn. We're going to meet twice a week at this time. But my professor was not calling me all the time and being like, hey, Tamara, what are you doing? Are you studying? Um, have you done this yet? What are you doing? Uh, are you in the library or are you at a cafe? Like they weren't doing that, right? Because you you were expected to kind of become an adult. But I often feel like with corporations, we've gone back to the high school model. And when you're really thinking about remote work, you need to think about how can you give people autonomy, which means that they have the capacity to decide when and where and how the work gets done, as long as it's falling within the deliverables that are needed and the deadlines. You know, some people might be better at working in the morning. Some people might be a little bit better at working in the afternoon. Some people may do certain tasks a lot faster than other people. Like that is completely fine. And when you give people autonomy, you allow them to work at their best location, their best time to do their best work. And so you you give people that trust and that consideration to do that. So that's what I think about when I think about autonomy. Third is mastery. Um, so I'm going to give a very kind of specific example, but it's from my life at this very moment. I have started taking an intensive summer school class in Latin. And probably, I don't know if I knew any words in Latin. Maybe I knew bata, which is fate. I really not very much Latin in my, in my vocabulary, right? And now I can translate small sentences. And I've seen this mastery over these two weeks. So that gives me a lot of encouragement of like, oh, wow, like something's really changed in these two weeks of me going to class nine hours a week and then studying a lot outside of class. And in the same way, you're going to want to see that mastery at work. You want to see that, you know, when you came in, you only had a certain level of knowledge of how the organization worked or how your functional skills at work, maybe you're a coder or a marketer or customer service. You may not have really understood. You may have been very slow. You may have, um, you know, you were just learning the ropes, right? But you would hope that in six months or a year later that you're faster, that you understand more, that things are clearer, that you're working faster. And so seeing that mastery and seeing that improvement over time is really important. But you're also going to want to make sure that you're mastering new things. And so I don't know if you've heard of the concept of flow, 
Um, but it's basically, you want to be in this like sweet spot of like, not too easy, not too hard. You want to be just challenging enough that you feel like you're, you're just in this like perfect zone of creation. And so, you know, that's what I recommend with mastery and like continue to have people master new, new steps over time and realizing that we're all going to be at different points within kind of the spectrum of mastery based on like what, what, what backgrounds we have, how long we've been in an organization. And that is natural. Um, and the fourth thing, I think this is something which I know we were talking about a little bit when uh, before we started talking, but there's this whole idea that, oh, we're not connected. Um, we have no culture now that we're remote. Let's do like a remote happy hour. That that's going to be the perfect solve or let's do a cooking event or I don't know, some type of like fun activity that's added onto work that's usually on a computer still. But really, when I think about connection, I think it's I think it's just as important, if not more important, and definitely a lot more sustainable if you're connected to the mission of the company and your core work. Because if you can feel that like your work matters, that you need to be a part of this team, that um, you being there makes the company different than if you were not there. If you feel connected to the mission statement and you feel like your organization is putting something into the world that needs to be there, you're going to feel a lot better about showing up at work every day than if you don't feel connected to any of that. And the only thing that gets you through this like job that is boring and that you feel like doesn't need to exist, but you need a paycheck and you're in this existential crisis. And the only thing that gets you out of it is a, a happy hour online. Like that's not going to be very sustainable over time. So we really recommend is trying to have people feel fine as a manager or as a leader to come up with connection points so that people can feel connected to their work. And if they don't, maybe you start questioning, like, why don't people feel connected to any of this? And that might also change the strategy of your organization. So Tamara, we were just talking about connection. And I had mentioned how there's a growing concern about loneliness and remote work. And you did say you had some thoughts on it, which I'm sure our listeners would appreciate hearing, because irrespective of those leaders who are using it as an argument against offering remote work opportunities, I'm sure there are leaders who would like to offer their employees a choice, but are understandably concerned about these reports of rising loneliness and the potential impact it will have on their employees. So do you have some ideas or suggestions for what leaders can do to address these concerns? Yeah, so first of all, I would say, I think loneliness makes sense actually. And so we are in a weird transition period where the last 50 years, a lot of our social lives and a lot of our decisions outside of work were impacted by work. So let's say, for example, I grew up in a suburb of Dallas and I ended up moving to a lot of places for work. So I moved to San Francisco with Google. I moved to Singapore with Google. Um, I worked in private equity and I moved to Boston. And so I had to you know, change my whole world to fit around work and the commute and what hours I needed to be there. A lot of my friends ended up being around work because it made it the easiest way to socialize. So at Google, my boyfriend, for example, was also a Googler. A lot of my friends were also Googlers. It was just the easiest way to socialize if they also worked with you because that meant they, they were living nearby. They were had a similar schedule. They could talk about similar things. They were also in the tech industry. Now we have this world where, you know, those constraints of our day-to-day -day work has changed. We can live in different places. If you are able to work remotely, you can work in different places. You can travel if you want to. You can work at different times. You don't have to be in this office every day with certain people for eight hours. And so all of that has changed. And so, you know, we do have to come up with different ways to get our daily socialization if it's not just given to us through an organization. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think all of your friends and all of your social contacts should all be related to work. In fact, I think over time that can be very dangerous um, from a, all your eggs in one basket. As you can see, um, I worked at Google for a really long time and there were just layoffs and I had good friends that were laid off from Google. And I think that makes it even harder with a layoff if that company has been your entire life for 12 years. Um, because all your friends were there and you moved with Google and you worked in different offices and all the friends that came to your wedding also worked at Google. And then all of a sudden, one day you get an email and you're laid off because the tech sector has, you know, had a, a, um, 
a recession or whatnot the last, you know, six or 12 months. And so I actually think creating more diversity in who you're hanging out with and who you're socializing is important. But I think actually there, it requires putting in that effort and it's not going to be just given to you through an organization. So that's the first thing. Um, but I think there's a lot of, this is the one thing that Ali and I really like to talk about. And it, it seems common sense, but if you've not been introduced to it, it, it might feel a little bit strange. Um, there used to be a lot of Gallup studies that used to say, like one of the best indicators for a retention was if you had a friend at work. And I think that is true. Um, but I think now with remote work, it actually looks different. And it's it's important to have a friend to work with. And so by this, I mean, you don't necessarily have to work with people that are at your organization. Um, so for example, Ali and I, we were roommates in Mexico City for a while. We would often work together and we worked at very different tech co companies. She was at DuckDuckGo, I was at Automatic. We had different jobs. I was in corporate development and partnerships and she was in HR, but we would meet at a cafe and we would do, you know, do some some of our own work, get on our calls, and we might chat afterwards. But I still had a friend to work with. I still had that socialization during the workday, but it didn't come from me being in an office and running into somebody at the water cooler. And so I do think we have to be intentional about creating those moments throughout our day. But if you're just missing kind of that background noise of people being around, actually, maybe what you need is a local coffee shop that you go to once or twice a week and you know the, the barista and you see some common faces in there. Uh, or, you know, maybe you you miss doing activities with people. And so maybe you end up joining an exercise class in the middle of the day that you go to that's in your neighborhood that is not related to work, but you see similar faces there. So there are all kinds of ways to combat loneliness, but I don't think it's a company's job to solve that problem for you. Because I think we're seeing loneliness is a common issue across Gen Z and high school kids. I think it is a part of our society right now. And it is not isolated to just remote work. It just has happened at the same time. So Tamara, we've talked about understanding how we approach our leadership so we can better understand how we view and engage with our team which is important in the context of a remote setting where we don't have those visual workplace markers to give us context. And now we've talked about the four needs leaders have to address to ensure their employees feel a sense of purpose and connection to what they do. Now I'd like to spend some time talking about what Ali and you call creating a team charter, where you draw inspiration from Bruce Tuckman and Mary Allen Jensen's work defining the five stages of team development, namely forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. So could you walk us through these different stages in terms of creating a team charter that will help employees better understand how to work together, especially when working remotely? I think a couple things are really important about this. It may seem simple, but when you actually put it into practice, it, it helps you understand something that can feel very nebulous when you're in the middle of the team. And that if you get any new group of people together, you're going to go through these stages over and over again. Because if somebody leaves the team, if somebody joins the team, if you have a new manager, you're always starting again because you're always adding new people. And so the first part is just forming and just the act of creation. And during this time, I think it's really important for people to know why they're on this team and why it's really important for them to be there. So some activities we recommend would be, you know, share your story. So, you know, you know, what's been the biggest influence in your professional journey? Who is somebody you would love to co-work with, living, dead, real, or imaginary? But just having those kind of stories show up, you're allowing people to safely share a little bit about themselves, about why they're there, about what they want to do professionally, and helping people to learn about them that's not based on superficial characteristics or make assumptions. Um, and we also think at this time, it's important to set kind of a team mission statement. So what is the mission of this team? Why have we chosen these four people? What are, what kind of skills are they showing up for? What do we want to create together? Because the thing is, if you don't make this transparent, um, we'll all have very different ideas of what the mission is of that team. And that can create a lot of problems later on when you actually realize like, oh, wait, that's very different in my head, or actually I hadn't really thought about that. And so by getting those out in words, on paper, thinking through it, it can be, it can set you up for a lot more success down the road and help your team focus. 
The second stage, I think this is like one of the most important ones to allow. It's called storming and I am very conflict resistant. (laughs) So this was actually really nice for me to see because I remember different storming stages happening at work and being like, oh, I hate this. Like, this is so uncomfortable. Um, I We should just leave, et cetera, et cetera. But when you lead into storming, and realize that it's a natural stage of people coming together that have maybe different strengths, different ways of how they imagine things working, that actually it's really good to sort these things out. And during this time, it can help you build trust that you can start um, you know, finding like what is the subcultures within your team and allowing you to understand like what things are tactical differences, what t- what things are personal differences, and how to work those things out. And so one thing I really like is, uh, I know maybe this is cliche, but I think it can be really helpful to do things like Myers-Briggs and also learn about how people might think. So as an example, I am an INFP. And so the way that I see the world is going to be different than somebody that might be more E or more S. So if somebody's more E, they may want to, you know, talk things out and talk things through a lot more while I'm more introverted and I'd like to walk, write things out. And it's not necessarily that we disagree on kind of the larger picture, but maybe our, our preferences on how to do that. And actually by storming and having that conversation, it can help us learn like, oh, what is a way that we can kind of get both of those needs met versus feeling like there's a best way to do something. Um, The third stage is norming. And this is when we recommend putting together that team charter. This is when you notice that actually the team is starting to do things without you telling them as a manager. So let's imagine that you have a best practice that, um, I don't know, you do kind of a, a stand up every Monday morning where people write in Slack what they're planning to do that week and what they did last week. And if you're not having to remind people anymore and they just naturally do that, you're starting to say, okay, these these behaviors that we're trying to have as a team are just naturally happening. So your team is forming. And at that point, you're going to want to document. And so we like for people to think of themselves almost as an anthropologist. So let's imagine if somebody came into your team tomorrow, they're brand new, or it could, you know, you could even go further with it. Like it's an alien. They've never even been to a workplace how could they read this team charter and understand what your team's about? So on this, it might be, what are the common words that we're using? What is the common language? What 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 are these things that make up our culture? What are our behavior norms? What is our mission? What are we learning right now? Um, anything that makes your team special, unique, that would help somebody come in right away and understand what your team is about. And so we have a little kind of template in our book, but you can put this together in one to two pages, but by having this written out, it makes it a thing. And once it becomes a thing, it becomes a culture and then it becomes a norm. And some ways I think about this is, um, as an example, when I worked at Google, they had kind of these this term called being googly when I first started. And there was these things about like, you can be serious without a suit. They had these like different things for the culture. And I remember I was coming in from private equity where I had to wear a suit every day. And all of a sudden I remember the first day like asking and being like, hey, can I wear jeans to work? And they're like, "Uh, we always wear jeans. Yes, (laughs) you can totally do that. Um, But that was a part of Google's culture. And by having it written out publicly on their website and within different things around the campus, I was able to very easily fit into Google's culture because it was written up and there was essentially a charter made up for what it looks like to be Googly. Uh, And I think that can be really helpful when you have people joining companies because nobody wants to feel like the odd kid at the lunch table that has no idea how to fit in. You want to know what are kind of the norms and what's expected. And not that you always have to fit into those norms, but it's much better to know that they exist than not know at all and just feel very lost. And so that's what we think about with the team charter. So I'd like to talk about those last two stages of team development together, Tamara, because I think they've collectively reflect something I think most leaders are aware of losing by moving towards a hybrid or remote workforce. In the stage of performing, the common challenge I hear from leaders is not being able to see your employees getting the work done, which honestly is about having more trust in your employees. But then there's also that challenge of adjourning where you either have to say goodbye to a team member or you're closing out a project. And we've seen in the news many examples of leaders resorting to doing mass layoffs over Zoom, while others leave it to employees finding out they've been laid off by realizing they can't sign into their company email anymore. 
So clearly leaders are having some challenges with these two steps right now. So what advice do you have for how leaders can do a better job managing these last two stages of team development, especially in the context of a hybrid work setting? Yeah. So I think for knowing your team is performing, you definitely have to have different metrics for how you're observing. So when I think of the old way of work, I tend to think of the the phrase from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And I think historically, we've thought if there are butts in seats for 40 hours a week, things will happen. And if you saw people in meeting rooms or buzzing around or talking or at the coffee machine, it meant that they were working because you know, work was this, you know, like all of these things encompassed work, right? So like the commute, or I think you mentioned before we got on air about like badging in, all of these things were considered work. You see a movie like Office Space, the cubicles are a part of work. Like there's all these other cues and parts of work culture that are not work itself. When you work remotely, I think it's much more important to focus on the outputs rather than the inputs. So the inputs are kind of this, like, how many hours are they sitting in this seat, et cetera. At that point, you're often have a proximity bias. So if people, if you see people more, talk to people more, you think they're doing more work. You can also have a lot of unconscious biases of preferencing people that look or act just like you. Um, when you move closer to an output model, you're thinking about, like, what is it that our team's trying to achieve? And how can I actually create metrics or ways of measuring it? that are based on the deliverable, not based on the person being there. So you're moving from like a time model to much more of an output or it's kind of like um, sometimes when I hire freelancers, for example, on different platforms, you can either pay for a certain amount of hours of work. So 20 hours of work, or for example, we had somebody create a trailer video for our book. And rather than paying one on an hourly basis, we paid them on a completed basis. So it was one and a half minutes, three revisions due by this time, et cetera. And I actually much more prefer the deliverable model because it's much easier for me to think through like, what is it I want this person to accomplish? And once I've set those, you know, those requirements, it's easier for me to go to one and be like, okay, this is what I really need you to create in this time period. Cause this is the deliverable. I'm not going to you know, I, if I only have three revisions, I'm going to be a lot smarter about how I'm asking this and the directions I'm giving and the vision I'm giving for the video um, versus on the hourly model. And I think we need to think about the same thing with full-time employees as well. Well, Tamara, Ali in your book is certainly an enjoyable, insightful read, especially for how often it seems like you knew what all the yeah buts that people were going to state for why this can't work, but also for how it helps to shine a light on what leaders can do to move more in the direction of, yeah, and this is where I see the future of work heading in our organization. And I think you've really helped us understand how to make that actionable and how to make it become a reality going forward. So thank you so much, Tamara, for the insightful and thought-provoking conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I always love connecting with people. So if you're listening and you want to learn more, uh, I am on LinkedIn at Tamara Sanderson. You can see a picture of our book as the banner to know it's me. Uh, but we also have a website, remoteworksbook.com. And our book is available everywhere. It's distributed through Penguin Random House. And it is our publisher is Barrett Kohler. So check it out. I promise there's lots of good advice in there. And it is very practical and tactical. And we try to keep it light as well so that it doesn't feel like a lot of business jargon thrown at you. Well, as Tamara already shared with you how you can learn more about her book and her work, I'm going to end off here by sharing with you how you can connect with me to learn more about my speaking work, whether that's giving keynotes or running a workshop on various leadership topics. Just go to my website at tevinnasir.com where you will find all that information on my speaking and workshop pages, as well as my contact form so you can connect with me. And before I wrap things up, I'd appreciate it if you could take a moment here to rate and review my podcast on your favorite podcast streaming platform. That would be greatly appreciated. I'm Tevin Nasir, and you've been listening to Leadership Biz Cafe.